Now we come to this paragraph we've been studying in depth for several weeks now. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith. And then this is the phrase we're going to focus in on today. To demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time, here's that phrase again, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures. Let's go to the Lord and thank him for his word this morning. Father, we do that. We thank you for your word. We want to... Confess this morning, Father, that we can't hear it, we can't listen to it, we can't receive it or cherish it or relish it or preach it or explain it without the explicit moment-by-moment -moment help of your gracious Holy Spirit. And so we ask you, Lord Jesus, to pour your Spirit upon us afresh. Help us to hear, to understand, to delight, to obey and to magnify this, your Word. Would you set a guard over the door of my mouth that I might not sin against you, but might only speak what is helpful to those who are here, especially my brothers and sisters. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, let's be honest. None of us like it when we see someone who is all about themselves. It's, it's a universal gag reflex, or it ought to be for every human being, when you see or meet someone who is utterly self-consumed. We have names for people like that, don't we? We call them egocentric, self-absorbed, prima donnas. When someone is, is wrapped up in themselves, it just rubs everyone the wrong way. A past couple of day, two days ago now, we, uh, our family got to go to Disney World. Uh, into the Magic Kingdom, and we took our kids because as a homeschooler, you're always educating. As a parent, you're always educating. We took them to the Hall of Presidents. Um, and in the Hall of Presidents, uh, if you don't know what that is, they talk through every single one of the presidents, has an animatronic, they say their names, they give a little history, and so we were giving a history lesson. I asked my children, who's your favorite president? And Addie told me, mine is Teddy Roosevelt. And I said, okay, that's great. We talked about last year in homeschool, the work he did for national parks and the United States and how important he was. I said, Emmett, what about you? He said, mine is Theodore Roosevelt. And I said, well, that's the same person. Uh, so uh, regardless, I thought about this and I remembered a quote that Teddy Roosevelt's daughter said about him that you probably hope that no kid ever says about you. She said, my father always wanted to be the corpse at every funeral, the bride at every wedding, and the baby at every christening. He was just a man who wanted to be in the spotlight, the center of attention at all times. What's interesting is that even though we find something like this so universally irritating, everything about our culture encourages it. In fact, Seeing yourself as the center of the universe is now really relegated as a virtue. Of course, it's not stated so bluntly. It's usually more the guidance counselor at every high school saying, no matter what, follow your heart. Don't let anyone stop you. Follow your dreams. Make sure you get realized. Shows up in even the most innocent places. Tim Keller noticed it in the sound of music. I know I've already ripped this movie before, but it's only because I love it so much. But when Maria sings, climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow your rainbow till you find your dream. We literally have millions of people whose unified goal is that they don't have unified goals, but are after whatever their own personal dream is. And it doesn't matter it's what your culture is or your generation is either. Within back-to-back -back years in the late 80s, NWA, coming straight out of Compton, had their song, which was entitled, Express Yourself. And then the next year, straight out of Bay City, Michigan, Madonna had her hit song, 
Express yourself. (laughs) This is really just the air we breathe. You need to put your best foot forward. Market yourself to the world that the best you is the best thing that could happen to this planet. You really need to exert and express you. You even hear it from Elsa in Disney's Frozen. It's time to see what I can do. I'm afraid my wife's about to start singing along, by the way. (laughs) It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. There's a sense if you get no external restraints and just express what's inside of you, that is the absolute best thing you can do. It's the highest virtue. And this is the American story right now. We live to be true to ourselves, to express ourselves. In fact, uh, Andrew DeBanco, who is uh, the Alexander Hamilton Professor of American Studies at Columbia University, has pointed out that in the history of America, we have lived for three different hopes. The initial stage of American life, there was a hope in God. And I'm not saying that every American in the Republic was a Christian, but there was a Godward orientation in the public life. Then it took one step down, hear me, one step down from it being about God in the American story to being about the nation. We have to live for this great nation, this city on a hill. We want to be a great nation and be a light to other nations. And that has now devolved to a living, Del Banco says, to that of self. So first off God, then to nation, to living for yourself. We act like we're joking about it, but we mean it when we say, I'm kind of a big deal. We have normalized being a prima donna. We actually have made it to be virtuous, to be all about the cultivation and expression of me. And I will tell you this, honestly, this is one of the reasons why we're so depressed as a culture. It's because your life, your time to shine, frankly, isn't going so well. Your career is not highlighting your talents. Your friends are not constantly in all of your awesomeness. No significant other has arisen to make you significant. Your kids think their smartphones are more interesting than you. And so for a person who was raised in a culture to focus on themselves, this is a huge deal. And so many wind up depressed because the promise of life, of being something special, greatly diminishes. And when it diminishes, depression seeps out. When you are the center of the story, life is depressing if it seems like you're just the extra on the set. Many of you, now listen to me here, many of you come to church every Sunday. And and often you will not find any real help in the church. The church has help because of what Jesus has done. The church has help for time and eternity always. But many who sit in these pews week after week will never find it. And the reason is because they're happy to accept Jesus' lifestyle, happy to think about Jesus' teaching, but they've never fully understood that Jesus isn't about complimenting them. That Jesus is about reorienting their lifestyle and their universe so that everything in their life is about Him. And when you approach Christianity and you're happy to take Jesus' advice on your money, on your clothes, and your relationships, the whole thing can be that you've assessed that Jesus can be the number one benefit to you. But the problem is, is when suffering comes into your life and the good things in your life are taken away, you start to really wonder whether Jesus is really going to work out for you. And then if you don't discover the truth and the reality that really it's all about him, you'll have no hope in the midst of your suffering. You'll have nothing to hold on to unless you understand that there's a reason for you to be diminished, a reason for you to experience death, a reason for you to suffer. And it only makes sense if Jesus is at the center of the universe. It won't make sense if you are the center. I'll tell you, I've seen this when I counsel guys in pornography. Their consciences are just racked with guilt. They want to quit. They want to stop. They feel terribly guilty. Yet despite counsel, despite scripture, they say that they can't. 
Because the number one thing they want is not to stop offending God and begin pleasing him. The number one thing they want is to get God off of their conscience so they can have their life back because the life that they're living is still fundamentally about them and not about God. The truths of the Bible do not work when we are at the center slapping Scripture upon our very self-centered lives. The truth of the Scriptures only exalt and elevate the soul when there is this uh, Copernican revolution where we realize the sun does not revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun. In the same way, Jesus does not revolve around us, we revolve around him. And I mention all of this because it helps us to see how deeply the Bible wants to challenge us. The Bible calls us to change the way we live. Sure it does. Yes, the Bible calls us to change what we hope in. Sure it does. But perhaps what is mostly something the Bible does is it calls us to reexamine what the center of our universe is. It calls us to re-examine what life itself is all about. It calls us to re-examine what every molecule and why every molecule in the universe exists. And it calls us to realize that everything is centered on God's story, not mine. We are not like a thousand books on the bookshelf, each one having our own very personal novel. No, there is one book on the bookshelf, God's story. The whole world is about him. And every single thing that happens in it revolves about him, around him. And we only find our rightful place in all of this mess when we realize he is the all-consuming center. I wonder if while we were reading our passage this morning, you notice that word demonstrate in the phrase that I pointed out to you. Verse 25 to demonstrate his righteousness than a rare bit of repetition that we've seen so far in the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul says the exact same thing in verse 26 where he says to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. So what is it that God is demonstrating? Well, we're told very plainly, obviously he's demonstrating his righteousness, but there's a lot in this verse. But I want us to begin here that the ultimate person eager to express himself And I would say the only person who has the right to do everything possible to make sure that he is known is God himself. Listen to me. Righteousness is not something God has or something God lives up to. Righteousness is something God is. God is not like one of the figure skaters we see in the Olympics who does a jump to try and get the judge to give him a 10. God is the 10. He is the standard of righteousness by which all things are judged. And here in this verse, what it tells us is he's saying to us, he is demonstrating his own righteousness. God is eager to demonstrate that he is the righteous one. So, so here we are having devolved from living from, to God, to living for nation, to living for self. And yet here is God's drumbeat for thousands of years over every millisecond of human history. I want all people to see me. This was all to demonstrate his righteousness. Now here's what I want to do this morning. I want you to notice what God says about himself as the most important thing in the world. And I want to ask this passage two questions. One, what is God demonstrating? And then second, why is he demonstrating it? First of all, What is he demonstrating? Well, we've already seen this a little bit. He's demonstrating his righteousness very clearly. He's demonstrating himself. But what I want to start with is I want to look at this a little bit more broadly in the context of Romans chapter 1 through 3. We're going to deal with Romans 3, 25 and 26 in a second, but I want us to fly over it. Uh, What does this mean that God wants to demonstrate himself? Well, the number one thing that you need to understand, if you're going to rightly orient yourself around God, is that everything that is or was or ever will be was created to display God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made the sun, the moon, the the fish, the birds, the land, the sky, and he made them male and female. He made all people, and he made them for one distinct reason. He made them all to declare himself. In fact, God in creation is demonstrating his glory. That's what we see very broadly. God at the beginning is demonstrating his glory. 
There's probably not a better place that summarizes Genesis 1 more perfectly. Well, obviously Genesis 1 does. But then Psalm 19. When Psalm 19 says this in, this in verses 1 through 5, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of His chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. What that text is telling us is every created thing, the air passing through your nose into your lungs right now, the food you are currently digesting, the ground on which you are currently resting, the sky under which you will walk this afternoon, the house you live in, the materials they are made of, every single part of it was made by God, and the skies are simply shouting God all day long. People may, may turn on their streaming services and say, man, they are only streaming godless things these days. Well, those things will never have more airtime than God because He has air. He is expressing Himself everywhere in all places in all times. He is saying constantly, I am glorious and I am good. I am great and not just able to uphold a house or a building, anything like that, but I can uphold skies and clouds, universes, stars, molecules, and the babies you hold in your hands. I uphold them all. He's speaking about himself. And so you need to hear this. The number one person who is expressing themselves is not the top artist or the top athlete. It is God. God is always talking about God. But not only does God talk about or demonstrate his own glory in creation, but even in creation, in the lives we live every day, he's also demonstrating and talking about his wrath. God is demonstrating his wrath. Uh, this should hopefully bring your minds back to however many months ago we studied Romans chapter 1, which we did for many months. So, a couple months there. Romans chapter 1, 18, right? If you don't remember it, you might want to flip to it. It shouldn't be too far. It says these words. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So, we've just said... That everything uh, is in creation is revealing the glory of God. Everything made is resounding, emanating, shouting, declaring, speaking, and poetry and song all day long. There is a God. There is a glorious God. There is a good God. But here in Romans chapter 1 verse 18, we, we read that His goodness and His glory are not all that's being declared. Notice it says in the present tense, the wrath of God is revealed. Now, I don't have time to go through this all, but hopefully you remember. If you don't, let me remind you. When it says the wrath of God is revealed, it is not talking about how God reveals His wrath in an eternal hell, though He will do that. Not in fire and brimstone, though He will do that. He's talking about how God reveals His wrath in the everyday moral depravity that you and I find ourselves in. That you and I see all around us. It says repeatedly in Romans 1 that because people rejected God, he handed them over to sexual morality, to lesbianism, to homosexuality, to malice, to being disobedient to parents and much, much more. The moral decay all around us, hear this, is the current revelation of the wrath of God. And I say that because here's the problem that you and I face right now in our culture. And I know because I'm struggling to face it every day and I'm battling it. Christians today are looking at the moral decay all around us and we start to get the idea that God is losing control of our nation. They get the idea that God is speaking less to America without realizing that God is shouting to our nation right now. He is not without voice. Every created thing says, I am glorious, and every example on the news or in your daily life of the moral depravity is God once again saying, I rule, I reign, but I also judge and hand over. 
So what we miss while everyone is trying to express themselves in their self-expression, which seems to take center stage, is it's just a side note to God's expression that he has handed people over to sin. And so when we talk or we walk in sin, we've been handed over to God's wrath. And God is the one expressing himself. Church, God is speaking all the time. He's always the one who has the first word, always taking the initiative. This world is his art gallery where he hangs every painting on every wall to say, look at me. Abraham Piper used to say, there is no square inch on which God does not say, mine. We could say there's no square inch on earth where God does not also say, look at me, either in glory or in judgment. Then you look at our passage. Now we're coming in narrow. We went out broad to see how God demonstrates himself. Now we're coming in narrowly and asking, what is he demonstrating here? Verse 25 again, to demonstrate his righteousness. Verse 26, to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness. What does that mean? Well, in the context, what we see in Romans 3 clearly is that God is demonstrating his righteousness through the sacrifice of Christ. So what is it that does this? Thankfully, it's right there in verses 24 and 25 that we've gone over the last couple times we've been in Romans, which tells us, in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. And we remember from last week, right, that a propitiation is a blood sacrifice to appease his own wrath, to be received by faith, to demonstrate his righteousness. So, so follow me here. Here we have God speaking again, and we have to be clear about what he's saying. And it's hard to know what he's saying because the word righteousness, as we've seen time and time again, gets used very differently in the book of Romans, doesn't it? In the book of Romans, the central way the word righteousness is used, we should probably all be ready to get up and preach this at this point, hopefully if you've been paying attention. The way righteousness is used centrally in Romans is it's the way that God reveals his righteousness that he gives to us as believers in Christ. He gives his right. So when the book of Romans usually talks about righteousness, it's talking about giving this gift to sinners. Giving the gift which God imputes to sinners, which he clothes sinners in. It's not talking about how God makes us righteous on the inside, which is true. But it's talking about something more foundational than that. It talks about how God takes people who are guilty and then he gives them a righteousness so they can stand justified in the throne room of God. That is the most glorious good news in the book of Romans, how it talks about righteousness and it's not what righteousness means right here. Here, we have to switch back. Here, the word righteousness in verses 25 and 26 to demonstrate his righteousness is actually talking again about the right character of God. That God always does what is just, that he always hates evil and loves good. That he is a righteous God. It's telling us that there's a place where we can see the right character, justice, and nature of God. And the place where we can see the righteousness of God is when an innocent person sheds their blood for sins. Do you see that? It says, God set forth Jesus as a blood sacrifice, as a propitiation by his blood through faith to do what? To demonstrate his righteousness. I'm going to work that out a little bit more in our second Point. But for now, let me just back up and review, okay? God is speaking about his own glory, which means Christians, we should be people who walk through this world and not get used to the weather. Don't just look at the weather as how it bears on you. Rain, I don't like it. Heat, I do or don't. Weather is not about you. Weather itself is about God. You can drop water from the sky without killing us. That's amazing. You can have a sun in the sky so that it's so hot that it warms us and doesn't fry us to a crisp. That's amazing. God's glory is being displayed in creation. It's also being displayed in creation through his wrath. When we see all the wickedness around us, we should not lose hope like God is not speaking. We should realize that God is speaking. 
that God's voice is speaking wrath, speaking judgment, handing people over to sin, which only the gospel that you and I know can save them from. And we should recognize the primary way he speaks about his righteousness and shows the seriousness of his righteousness is when he takes the blood of his own son for sinners so that they can be delivered from all their unrighteousness. So what is God demonstrating? He is showing his glory and his wrath and his righteousness. Now let's ask this question. Why is he demonstrating it? Why is he demonstrating his own righteousness? Notice that Paul gives two reasons why God is demonstrating his righteousness in the cross of Christ. He says the reason I'm showing my righteousness is because of something that has happened in the past. So look at verse 25 with me. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So there's something that happened in the past. Then notice in verse 26, he's demonstrating his own righteousness, secondly, because of something that's happening right now in the present. Do you see that? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So why is God demonstrating his righteousness because of something that happened in the past? Let's take that one first. The first thing you need to think about is what past are we talking about? Well, Paul is clearly talking about the past before Jesus Christ. In the past, something happened that made it necessary for God to proclaim his righteousness. What happened in the past? It's right there in the text. God passed over the sins of his people. This is one of those questions that everybody asks when it comes to Old Testament saints. And so if you have a question about biblical theology here and how they were saved in in Old Testament, listen up. This is for you. God passed over the sins of his people. He bore with them and didn't punish all their sins. That makes him look unrighteous. So let me explain this to you. Think about Moses. Moses, we're told, is the greatest leader in Israel's history until Jesus comes. Moses murdered a man at the very beginning of his leadership. Right? He's trying to save some Israelites from the, the Egyptians, but Modus, Moses murders an Egyptian. And I know we read the text and think, oh, it's self-defense. The Bible uses the word murder. There was intent there. He, here's the problem. Genesis, which I don't know if you know this, Moses wrote, by the way, says you're supposed to have the death penalty over your life if you murder anyone. Yet Moses gets to lead God's people, this great nation, after he's already murdered someone. God showed forbearance with him. He passed over his sins and he gets to be a leader. Maybe you've heard of this fellow Judah. Judah is the one who would bring about the Lord Jesus Christ from his tribe. Judah, you might remember, slept with his daughter-in-law when she was posing as a prostitute. What does God do to Judah? Judah. He gives him the greatest blessing the world has ever known by allowing his line to be the one which the Messiah comes through. Abraham, not once, but twice asked his wife to lie so that he could save his own skin and she gets stuck in a harem. Abraham is given the blessing that will bless the world and lead to Jesus. Samson is sleeping around, squandering his power, and he's a hero as an example of faith for the people of God. David, a man of God's own heart, is an adulterer, murderer, and polygamist. These are the heroes of the Old Testament. These are the ones on our side. These are our founding fathers. And so what does it say about God that all the Egyptians die and Moses the murderer gets to live? What does it say about God that all the Canaanites die, but the rest of the Israelites, who are just as sinful as they are, get to live? It says he's not righteous. He's not just. This is a major blight on the character of God. And when your whole purpose is to express yourself, you may want to make sure people understand you correctly. So so does God just wink at the sins of Moses, Abraham, David, Samson, and Judah? No. No. He shows his righteousness by pulling the blood out of the brow of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. He paid their sins in Christ. 
This propitiation, this blood sacrifice of Jesus was to show God's righteousness because he had passed over former sins. He had passed over them. So you might say God doesn't really care about his people's sins. But at the cross of Jesus, he says, I care deeply. And whereas every Canaanite and Egyptian would pay with their own blood, all my people will be paid for by Christ's blood. So I'm not unrighteous at all, but fully righteous. Have more questions about that. Just wait till we get to Romans 4. Here's the point. Moses didn't get away with it. Christ died for him. Abraham didn't either. Christ died for him. David didn't go to heaven because God gave him a pass. David went to heaven because Christ died for him. And now, interestingly, this might be a great place for you just to get to share the gospel. Because a lot of times when you're sharing the gospel, you're sharing with people who know just enough about the Bible to, to know all the parts that look inconsistent. And so they're looking at you going, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but all your heroes in the Old Testament wouldn't be qualified to be pastors in your church. You ever thought about that? All the polygamists and adulterers? So how do you deal with your Bible? What you tell them is that my Bible only makes sense with Jesus Christ at the center. Romans 3.25 says, yes, God did pass over those sins, but not because he didn't care, but because he was going to give the full wrath they deserved to his son as an act of grace. Notice the switch Paul makes here. That's the past. He makes a switch to the present time. Again, verse 26. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, God has a problem, not just in the past, but right now at the present time. In fact, I would say present time is certainly speaking when Romans was written. But honestly, we're in the exact same age. The problem God still has at this present time is his people still aren't holy enough to go to heaven. That's, that's a problem. His people still aren't holy enough to go to heaven. In fact, by the end of the book of Romans, he's going to have to tell people they shouldn't hate their enemies. Because guess what? Christians who follow Jesus and are Christians will still need to be taught not to hate their enemies. He's going to have to tell them in Romans 13 to submit to their government. Because Christians living under pagan kings still have trouble honoring them. Amen? Oh, there ought to be a lot of amens. You probably have a few jokes this week you need to repent of. I know I do. We still struggle to honor the government. We still struggle to love our neighbors. Romans 14 and 15. We still struggle to have people who aren't like us over for dinner. How can God accept us at the present time? Even though we are not as holy and righteous as Jesus in our everyday lives, how can he accept us? That's a problem for God. I mean, yes, we want the church to be holy. We want the church to be a good witness. But friends, the church this side of heaven is never going to be such a good witness that everybody says, wow, you guys are exactly like Jesus. They are always going to be able to say, how can God accept you? How can he be righteous and accept you who I saw snap at your wife? Or you who lost your job because of some misconduct last year? How in the world can God accept you? Church family, he can accept me the same way that he accepted Abraham, David, Samson, Moses, and Judah. At the present time, he demonstrated that his son has poured out his blood for my sins. That's why God can be called the just and the justifier. Those two titles, by the way, should not go together at all. Have you ever thought about that? Your father's name is the just and justifier. Just means he is going to punish wickedness, utterly destroy it. Justifier means he declares the evil righteous. Just a fire means he declares sinners to be forgiven. How can he be the one who punishes sin as well as the one who blesses sinners? How can he be those two things without morally exploding within himself? 
Because in Christ, all of his justice was satisfied by pouring the full wrath of his anger and righteousness on Christ. He can never be called unrighteous because he has dealt with sin in his son Jesus. And now that sin is dealt with in Christ and full wrath has been absorbed in Christ, now he can give us Christ's righteousness. Church family, this is so important. Because when you sink into discontentment, when you go off in anger, when you snap at your wife or your kids, when you ruin your witness at work, or ruin your witness at the grocery store on the clerk who's just taken far too long, there is this gnawing, haunting reality that will come to your conscience. And the reality is this, God ought to judge me. The gnawing at your conscience will be, it would be wrong for God to bless me the way I've treated my family. There's no way my life can work out. God needs to bring me down. It would be wrong for him not to, except that because of Christ, it is now right for him to lift you up. Because of Christ, it is now right for him to declare you righteous and simultaneously be perfectly righteous. This is your salvation. This is the sunshine that you live under every single day of your life, that even though you fail daily, Nonetheless, it is actually right of God to justify you and it would be wrong of God to judge you because he has already judged his son in your place. Friends, this is why they call it gospel. Because <laughs> it is good news. That's good news for the depressed, the weary, the self-absorbed, the prima donnas. The good news of God is he wants to express himself so he does so in righteousness, not on your head, but on the head of Christ. That he expresses his righteousness in a way that he can give grace. That's amazing. This turns out to be, church, a better world than a self-centered world. Look, some of you are good at being self-centered. I know I am, though I shouldn't be. <laughs> Because some of you actually have talents that are actually awesome. You develop skills. You're actually good at things. Self-absorption just works for you. Except this. You're going to die soon. And you're going you're to face the realities of getting older. And as Paul puts it, that outer body decaying. And soon all the awesomeness that is you will be dragged down by God to the grave. And then, self-centeredness won't work anymore. But God-centeredness is a more beautiful and wonderful way to look at life. A truer and better way. Yes, your weak and your self-expression is going to come to an end one day. He is going to take you off stage right. But He will remain at center stage saying, I am glorious, just, and gracious. I will receive you from the bottom of my heart. So for the rest of us who are not that cool at being ourself, maybe we try to dress cool and it doesn't work, I think everybody needs to consider the fact, what if expressing yourself just doesn't work for you? Like what if you build a family and it falls apart? You express a sexuality but nobody finds it desirable. You open your heart and don't find anyone that you can sustain a relationship with. You show all your talents and it turns out you're not that talented. You give vent to all your lust and it just leaves you alone and unsatisfied. I imagine if that's you, at some point, you're going to judge yourself. And you will view yourself as a failure. Or as one person has put it, self will begin to crush you. The very thing that once offered you freedom, I can just be myself, will lead you to find out that you will disappoint yourself. You will fail yourself. And that self winds up being a horrible master. Oh, what a better master is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. One who, when you fail, will forgive you. One when you can't express yourself anymore because you're too sick 
too sore or too much suffering, has expressed himself in grace, peace, and mercy. What a glorious and good thing it is that God is the center of the universe. There is hope for the healthy and sick, for the suffering and successful, that God is revealing himself most predominantly in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of grace and truth. Praise be to God. Would you stand as we close this morning with a song? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have demonstrated your righteousness to us. We thank you that you have displayed yourself to us. We thank you for the God-centeredness of the universe. Father, that's not a slogan. It's a glorious reality. That you and your expression of yourself is the most important thing in the world. Father, would you help us, Lord, to join in your story? That we would orient our lives around what you're doing? So whether we are sick or successful, depressed or happy, we would know you are working all of this together to display your glory. And you are good and you are faithful. And there's only one place where we know that to be of the utmost truth. And it is in the sacrifice of your son on our behalf and the gift of his righteousness bestowed upon us. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. We ask that you would help us live our lives as those who are not the center of our own story, but who are blessed in the ability we get to play the tiniest, littlest, most insignificant part of yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.